I'm going to, I'm having the pleasure and honor to introduce, briefly introduce Ken Lish, who is our speaker, and he's president of the Bookline Historical Society. So he, he recently retired from Boston University Libraries, head of the Liaison and Instruction Services, and his, his uh, real avocation at the, is book, as, as Bookline's historian, and he's very well known for contributions to many postings on, on, on Brookline history. So he he's, uh, knows a lot of stuff about Brookline's history. He's going to tell us for whom Coolidge Corner was really named. <laughs> and so I want to present Ken Liss, president of the Brookline Historical Society, and we're delighted to hear from him today. Thank you. Uh, very glad to be here. Um, uh, I, I think the, the two things I like uh, most in the world are uh, doing research and uh, finding stories, one, and two, sharing those stories. So any opportunity I get to uh, uh, share some of the things that I discover uh, is always uh, uh, welcome. Um, I'm going to share my screen. So uh, what, what a lot of people don't realize is that people have been shopping in Coolidge Corner for uh, more than a century and a half. Um, it wasn't always that way. Uh, Beacon Street didn't even exist for the first 145 years of Brookline's existence as a town. This is what uh, the, a view of the area of Beacon Street looking towards Coolidge Corner uh, before the Coolidge, uh, Beacon Street was widened in the 1880s. Uh, it was uh, very uh, sparse, very few buildings, um, and mostly farmland. So, so, so Beacon Street was laid out in 1850 and 1851 as a narrow 50 foot wide uh, country lane, a dirt road going from Boston through Brookline uh, to uh, what's now uh, Cleveland Circle. In 1857, uh, two brothers named George and William Coolidge established this store known as Coolidge and Brother. I've always been curious about which one was Brother and which one was Coolidge. So, um, <laughs> Uh, but uh, it was a, uh, a, a meeting place, a, a grocery store. Uh, William and his uh, family lived on the second floor and they sold all kinds of goods, including goods from uh, other parts of the world that were brought into Brookline and could be delivered around town. As it says, goods delivered free in any part of the town. So um, this was the store uh, on, on the right is Harvard Street and on the left is um, is Beacon Street. The uh, town Hayscale was there. There was a trough for feeding horses and it was a, a gathering place as well as uh, a place that um, uh, people could buy groceries. Now, you may have seen recently that a little uh, further up Harvard Street, there's a new building known as the Calvin at Coolidge Corner um, because there are a lot of people who think that Coolidge Corner is named for Calvin Coolidge. Um, and uh, he was actually a distant relative of the Coolidge's, the Brookline Coolidge's, but it was known as Coolidge's Corner before he was born. And um, I would like to uh, change it to the William and George, but I don't think that's going to happen. Um, and that is not William and George sitting on the bench. Um, uh, they uh, were there for many years. It was the only business in North Brookline until the 1880s, so for, for, for 30 years, and uh, sold all kinds of goods and was very, very well known. Uh, William Coolidge died in 1884, and the store was sold to a man named Merrill Brown, who continues the store uh, for a number of years until things really changed due to these two men. Uh, Henry Whitney, who uh, lived in, in, um, on Pleasant Street and uh, hired uh, Frederick Law Olmsted to design the Grand Boulevard that replaced the earlier uh, dirt road uh, and made it three times the width and, and, uh, and, and really led to a lot of change. Uh, Whitney uh, introduced streetcars and uh, after uh, visiting Richmond, Virginia, which had put in electric streetcars, decided to make the streetcars on Beacon Street electric. And so, so Brookline was not the first to have uh, electric streetcars, but no uh, 
community of Boston size had them before, and it really led to a, a spread of uh, this and and uh, and that led to a, a lot of development along this new boulevard uh, uh, and around it. Uh, residences and businesses soon followed. So I'm going to talk about three uh, early periods of development of the commercial part of uh, Coolidge Corner and and. Uh, uh, the majority, probably 75% of the buildings that hold stores in Coolidge Corner today uh, date to these three periods, to the 1890s, the 1910s, and the 1920s. So uh, these buildings were all built in the 1890s. They all had uh, commercial properties on the ground floor and residences above. Um, an ad was in the um, Boston Post in 1891 about uh, to let stores on the Beacon Street Boulevard. and uh, one of the first of these was a building known as the Willard at the corner of um, uh, um, Beacon Street and um, uh, and, and that, that rounded corner still exists today. It was a corner drugstore. You know, when you look at it today, you say, yeah, that would be a corner drugstore. It just looks like a place for a corner drugstore. There were several drugstores that were in there. At the time of this picture in 1914, it was the Gammon drugstore looking towards, uh, uh, towards the east, towards um, towards Brookline, uh, towards Boston. There were a number of stores that, that filled this building over the years, including uh, the Newcomb and Frost uh, Grocers in 1894. Uh, uh, George Coolidge, who had gone to work in Boston for Newcomb and Frost, came in and worked at that store um, uh, later. Uh, a business that was there for many years was the W.L. Steves uh, Electrician and Locksmith, a hardware store that was established in what's uh, part of what is now um, the paper source. And uh, this was Willard Steves. Uh, when I first moved to, to, uh, uh, to Boston in, in, in the 1980s, there was Steves Hardware um, in this location. And I uh, uh, always thought, uh, when, when I learned about W.L. Steves, I thought, oh, it was spelled Steves with, with, with two E's, but it wasn't. Steves Hardware actually dropped the second E, um, but, uh, but that's where the name originated from. And uh, eventually, uh, the son of, of, uh, of W.L. Steves kept up the electrical contracting business, but sold the hardware store. And the electrical contract business is still around. Um, you'll see W.L. Steves trucks driving around uh, around town, although the family's no longer involved in the business. Uh, further to the east in 1893 was the Albion Knowlton building, uh, again, with uh, apartments above and stores on the ground floor, 1893. Uh, one of the businesses on the east side of that was the uh, uh, Thomas's Seafood that was there for more than 40 years and is today Wavelands Hair Saloon. At the other end uh, today is uh, the Eureka, which uh, um, Dave Lashinsky is my neighbor. He lives two doors away from me in, on Washington Street, and uh, he's in that building. And uh, in the middle between those was a building known as the Shapely Building, named for the developer, built in 1898, again, with uh, apartments above and stores on the ground floor. So those three buildings along the south side of Beacon Street um, uh, were, were among the early ones from the 1890s period. But the real big change that really spurred a lot of growth in uh, Coolidge Corner uh, came when this man, Wallace Pierce, the son of Samuel Pierce, the founder of SS Pierce, decided to come to Brookline. Uh, uh, he, he bought the property at the corner where uh, from um, uh, Merrill Brown, who had taken over the Coolidge and Brothers store. Uh, S.S. Pierce had started in Boston. They had a store along the waterfront. Then they built the store at the, uh, the corner of um, uh, Tremont and Court Street, shown on the top, and a big store in uh, Copley Square, shown at the bottom. And in uh, 1892, after they bought uh, the former SS Pierce, uh, the former uh, Coolidge and Brothers store, they actually moved the store slightly to the west. And there's this wonderful picture uh, looking up at um, uh, Quarry Hill. You can see on the left is the SS Pierce store. Uh, I'm sorry, the Coolidge and Brothers store, as it originally looked, it was moved slightly to the west, and the corner lot was used for loading and unloading wagons for about six years when the SS Pierce Company built the SS Pierce building in 1898 and 1899. And this became uh, the 
symbol of Coolidge Corner, if not of Brookline itself. It looks a little bit different than we know it today. It had this open tower that uh, uh, people could go up and look out and get a great view. That tower was damaged in a storm in 1944 and then was replaced with the current tower. Still a, a, a magnificent building, but we lost that, uh, that open tower. And here's a view of it uh, later in the 1940s with the inset showing what the original tower looked like. The uh, upper floors of this building included Whitney Hall, named for Henry Whitney, which was a beautiful hall where uh, all kinds of events could take place. And, uh, and there were many kinds of events. There were parties and theater productions and weddings and concerts that all took place on the second floor of the building in Whitney Hall for many years until uh, the 1950s when uh, the hall was kind of uh, broken up and turned into uh, uh, office buildings on the second floor, offices on the second floor, which are uh, it's still used for uh, today. Uh, uh, kind of catty corner uh, of, uh, from the SS Pierce building was a, a, a series of low buildings that had a bank and an insurance company uh, in, the, in the early years until 1930, when the Boulevard Trust Company, which was in one of those low buildings, uh, built a new, a new building uh, under construction at the top. And as it originally appeared when it was built in 1930 uh, on the lower left, uh, in 1948, a third floor was added. And that's the building that uh, has gone through several banks, but is um, uh, um, you know, it's still still a bank uh, bank today. Uh, across the street from that, you can see this is looking west, and you can see those three 1890s buildings on the far right uh, that that we looked at earlier. Uh, next to those is a 1919 bank building that still stands, but uh, the corner there too was a low building uh, that was there for many years until uh, 1950 when the current building was built that that uh, at one point housed uh, a Howard Johnson's restaurant um, on, on the corner. Uh, in that period uh, between the 1890s and the 1910s, there were a few other developments. One was this building, which was built as the Beacon Universalist Church on Harvard Street, uh, just north of the um, SS Pierce building. And it was rather an unusual church. And if you look at the layout, you can see that there was an entrance from Harvard Street into the church, but there were four storefronts in the church building. And uh, that uh, church uh, uh, was in operation until the 1930s when it was converted to the Coolidge Corner Movie Theater. Um, and the, the entrance to the theater in this picture was uh, on Harvard Street uh, in the later, uh, um, when it was threatened several times with, with us losing the theater. The entrance is now around the corner and there are stores on the Harvard Street side, but there were stores when it was a church, when it was built. Um, so that's kind of a, a going back to uh, what it originally was. Um, this map with some color coding uh, shows a little bit about the development over the decades. So uh, it's probably a little bit hard to see, but the, the pink numbers are the buildings from the 1890s and, the, and uh, there's a, a couple of early 1900s buildings uh, along uh, uh, Beacon Street and Harvard Street, pretty close to the intersection. In the 1910s in, Greens, in green, there were more buildings kind of spreading in every direction. And I'm gonna talk about some of those buildings uh, next. So this is the second wave. Um, and uh, I'm gonna focus particularly on one called the Coolidge Corner Building, which uh, if you say that to most people, they'll probably think you mean the SS Pierce Building, but it's actually the building across Harvard Street that. Uh, was built in 1912. Here's uh, uh, a, a news article from the Boston Globe about uh, the sale of that building. Uh, it had been part of the Whitney family estate and it was sold uh, to a developer named Lauren Towell who uh, built this, this building in 1912. Uh, here's a, an early picture of the building soon after it opened. I love this that you have uh, both a, a horse-drawn vehicle and some early cars in this picture. And it's a, it's a building that people don't often notice because it's uh, um, much more noticeable if you look up at it and people don't often look up. But it's really a beautiful building with, um, with uh, um, uh, stone and carved stone um, and beautiful facades that, that go in. Um, and uh, the corner where CVS is was a Liggett's drugstore. And I'm gonna just read to you something that it says in this advertisement uh, 
that was in one of the Boston papers. It said, this is the first of many Ligget stores to be located in suburban territory. It is the first suburban drugstore in America to be conducted on strictly metropolitan lines in point of assortment, service, and downtown prices. Brookline is entitled to metropolitan service. It is the richest town in the world, something that was often said of Brookline in those days, as well as the most cultured. Its citizens constitute the choicest patronage in all America. Its men and women know values. They know what real service is. We believe they will appreciate having both just around the corner. I, I, I love that, uh, that, that quote. Um, so, so Brookline was this, this growing community and Coolidge Corner was a growing neighborhood and this national chain, uh, Liggett's, uh, saw an opportunity to open a store in, in this, this brand new building. There were a lot of other businesses in the building. Uh, in the early years, as the, the neighborhood grew, there were a lot of hardware stores, many of them uh, opened by contractors like W.L. Steves, who was an electrician, and F.D.F. Lewis, who was a plumber, but they also sold all kinds of uh, uh, um, hard hardware. Um, I, I, I love, there, were, there, were, there, was, uh, there were some restaurants, the very cleverly named place called The Food Shop, um, uh, opened in 1916 in the building. Uh, and this picture of the All-America Shoe Shop from 1927 shows you a sense of the, the entrances to these buildings, which still exist with the, the, the um, uh, really rather elegant um, openings into, into the store. Um, this uh, sketch of an ad from uh, the 1920s shows the two uh, stores at the, at the very end, which at that time were the Brookline Bank. The one at the far left, when the building first opened, was the first Coolidge Corner branch of the Brookline Library. It was there in 1912 until 1915 when it moved down the street, um, and today it's Starbucks. So, uh, so that Starbucks was originally the Coolidge Corner branch of the library. Uh, I, 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 have tried, but have not yet found a picture of that as the library. I'd love to find that. So maybe someday it'll show up. Um, to the west of the Coolidge Corner building, there had been a wooden commercial building that burned in a fire in 1913 and was replaced. The uh, SS Pierce Company built uh, something known as the Pierce Block, which is the building that uh, stands to the left. A third floor was added in the 1950s, but that building uh, still uh, stands today with both uh, commercial properties and offices above. Um, back to the map, we go next to the, the third major period of development uh, indicated by the, the buildings in the light blue. And you can see they're spreading further north on Harvard Street, further south than Harvard Street, and, and a few more on um, Beacon Street itself. Uh, I'm going to focus on uh, a few buildings that were part of this development. The Altman block in 1923 was the, the, the one that really kind of spurred that 1920s growth and development. Pelham Hall in 1926 and the Arcade in 1927, as well as a few other buildings that uh, came to be in the uh, 1920s period. So this is the Altman block built by a developer named uh, Samuel Altman. And um, just the, the names of the developers uh, sometimes give you a clue of some of the change because a lot of the developers in 1920 were, were, were Jews. So uh, Jewish um, uh, population in Brookline was growing and, uh, and several of the, 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 the business people and the developers in the 1920s uh, will, had, had, had Jewish names and the Altman block is one of those. So when this building opened, uh, and this is a very early picture, I believe this may be even before some of the storefronts were occupied, but uh, there are some other pictures here of, of the building. The northernmost part of it uh, to the left of the entrance uh, was the, uh, the boulevard branch of the Brookline Post Office. So when, when this opened, that's what, that's what was occupied that space. The um, the, the, the facade of the building, um, uh, which was made of what was known as cast stone. So it wasn't carved stone like the 1910 buildings, but it was a stone that could actually be cast in molds, which was a lot cheaper, a lot quicker, and a lot more flexible because you can you can mold it into pretty much anything. Um, so there were stores on, on both sides of this building. That facade kind of got deteriorated in the 1970s. It was replaced with a new facade that's still, still a lovely building, but is not the original uh, facade. The second floor of the building, which is now a health club, 
was where the billing operations for the New England Telephone Company stood. And these are some pictures from the local newspapers of uh, the uh, women. It was, it was women that worked in the billing operation. Um, and that's what it looked like where uh, it's the, the health club is a women's health club. So that's still occupied by women, but instead of uh, sending out bills for the telephone company, they're uh, taking care of their health and exercising uh, upstairs and uh, in, in, in that building. The, the far left of the building, which had been part of the office, was uh, uh, a, a restaurant known as Barney Chef's Delicatessen. It was a chain. There were a number of these around the Boston area, and this opened in the 1930s, I believe. Um, and you might not recognize this, but uh, this is where Zoftig's is. And actually, if you look at the bar on the left, you can really see that it's the same. It's the same place. So that's been a restaurant for uh, for a very long time. But it was originally uh, part of what was the the uh, the, the post office and uh, that stayed there until the current post office was built uh, with WPA funds in the 1930s. Uh, Across the street is a, a, a gem of Coolidge Corner, the arcade building built in 1927. Um, uh, beautiful uh, uh, terracotta tile floor and brass and um, kind of faux marble um, and glass and just a, a beautiful building with the skylight. Um, I, I, I happen to have a, a particular affection for skylit arcade buildings. And everywhere I go, I take pictures of them. I, I have a collection of them and there are some amazing ones around the country. This is a rather modest one, actually, but but uh, beautiful nonetheless. Um, this opened in uh, 1927. Um, and uh, the, the the picture on the bottom, you can see some of that cast stone. So some of the, the, the design of the building was the kind of thing that could be done uh, without uh, actual craftsmen of the kind that were required in an early day to actually carve the stone um, uh, and, and, it, and all kinds of motifs. And, and many of the 1920s buildings have interesting designs made out of the cast stone. I love the way that it says in the ad up there, it says liberal parking space. And that was not only parking for political liberals, it was uh, <laughs> parking for uh, that. Uh, and I believe that the liberal parking space was not the big parking lot that's behind the building now because th there were houses there that it was, uh, I, I believe it referred to the parking that is now the employee parking to the north of the building um, that, that is used. So um, this, this building had uh, a, a quite a variety of occupants. Uh, I, I love the naturally corsets, scientific fitters um, for the matron as well as the miss. Um, and uh, the music salon, which is on one of the uh, Harvard Street storefronts where people could come in and not only uh, um, look at audio equipment, but listen to it. There's a listening room where you could see what it sounded like, uh, a hair place, uh, an antique store. Many of the early shopkeepers in the arcade were immigrants, um, which, which is very interesting. Um, but uh, not very long after this building opened in 1927, the, the Great Depression hit and the building was empty for a long time. And it's never quite, I'd say, recovered. I think that uh, it, it's um, for, for, for many, many years, a lot of the businesses in the arcade were um, not the type of business that you found elsewhere in Coolidge Corner. I think that's starting to change now, um, but it's, uh, it's, 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 it's really a treasure uh, within Coolidge Corner. Other uh, uh, 1920s buildings uh, uh, occurred north and uh, north of, of, of uh, Beacon Street and Harvard Street, just uh, several of the buildings that are still in use today. And um, one of these was uh, this building uh, near the arcade, uh, 308 to 312, built in 1926, that um, uh, has uh, a number of businesses. What I'm particularly intrigued about this is the, um, the second floor, which in this early picture has a pool and billiard uh, parlor on the top floor. There was a bowling alley in the basement um, where the, uh, um, the, the, the uh, Beantown uh, dog place is now. The, the, when, when they moved in there, they, they had to tear out multiple layers of floor, including bowling alley floor that they found in there. Um, and uh, so, so you had pool, you had bowling. And at one point, uh, if there are any golfers here, you probably know the name Donald Ross, 
who was one of the most famous um, designers of golf courses, designed hundreds of golf courses in, uh, in the United States. And this oddity is that he designed a miniature golf course on the second floor of this building uh, in, I believe it was 1932. It didn't last very long, um, but it's really intriguing. And the, 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 the Donald Ross archives, which are at Pinehurst in North Carolina, one of his most famous golf course, they have a record of all his designs. They have no record of this miniature golf course that he designed indoors. But, um, but it, it was him, uh, I, I verified that. Um, uh, I mentioned that the, the Coolidge Corner Library moved from what's now the Starbucks up the street. They moved into this house, which was one of the last houses in Coolidge Corner. Um, uh, from 19, they were in this building from 1915 to 1928 when they moved uh, to Pleasant Street um, and the house was torn down. Um, and it was replaced by another of the 1920s commercial buildings um, and that has had a series of restaurants from that time until the present day. Um, I love this design. When I first found this advertisement on the lower right, this sort of uh, art modern motif on the building and a spectacular menu um, that a local collector has and, and uh, allowed me to scan. Uh, this was there in the 1930s and 40s. And later, the same space became Jack and Marion's, uh, something that many, many people in Brookline remember. Uh, it was there from the 50s until the early 70s. And you could see uh, here uh, the same building. Uh, there. Um, and like uh, the spectacular menu of the Café de Paris, they had their own menu, spectacular in its own way, uh, known for their skyscraper sandwiches. Um, and that's gone through many, many restaurants and is still a, a restaurant today. Uh, it, uh, it is now, let's see, it was the Japanese tea house, and I forget what the name of the place that's there now, but uh, but it continues to it, it's been a restaurant uh, throughout its life, and that's uh, that's really quite uh, uh, amazing. Um, there were more 1920s buildings uh, south of Brookline, uh, including uh, the one where. Um, uh, Brugger's Bagels is now on the corner, and that was originally the Fuller and Son Lumber Company, and there was a, a sketch of that uh, um, in, in the Brookline newspapers uh, early on. I love the sketches. The photographs are wonderful, but those newspaper sketches are wonderful as well, and I like to uh, incorporate those in uh, a lot of the uh, slideshows that I do. Um, in also built in 1926 was Pelham Hall at the corner of Pleasant Street and, um, and Harvard. And this building was kind of a throwback in a way to those 1890s buildings because it had commercial space on the ground floor and apartments above, and it still does today. Um, and, um, and this uh, has been home to a lot of different businesses. There was a real estate office there when I first came to Brookline. There was a toy store there um, at a time when uh, Brook when Coolidge Corner had five. No, Brookline had five toy stores. Four of them in in Coolidge Corner, and uh, one of them was was uh, it was the Learning Express that was in this space. But apartments were above when it first opened. It was the home to uh, a a a business that um, uh, was. Um, uh, a, a business that was in um, downtown Boston. It was a women's clothing store that uh, called uh, ES Slattery. And they opened a branch in, in this building and it was a women's clothing store. Um, at, at one point, there's a wonderful ad uh, that talks about coming to buy swimsuits. And it says, you can try our swimming pool in the basement. Now, I assume it wasn't a full swimming pool, but they probably had a pool decked out where uh, they could people could try on bathing suits. Uh, someday I got to get in the basement and see if uh, there's any remains of that swimming pool, uh, like, like there are to the, that there was to the bowling alley in, in the, in the other building. Um, but uh, in uh, the, the 1928, um, this, this building, um, and again, here, here's some more pictures about the E.T. Slattery. There's a, there was a Saab dealership in there at one point um, and many other things, but I'm going to kind of, uh, kind of wrap this up with a, a quote that appeared in, uh, in the paper uh, 
1928. And this was an editorial in the, in the Brookline paper. And it talked about the misgivings of leading economists when the Slattery Company announced its intention of establishing a branch of its great business in the Coolidge Corner section of Brookline. The company was advised that it would probably take several years to establish itself in a community so close to a large city. And when the response of Brookline's discerning shoppers proved immediate and empathetic, the company was advised that it was because this new type of shop was a novelty and would presently wear off. Mr. O'Connell, who is the manager of Slattery, has proven that it has not taken several years to establish his Brookline branch, and he has forced the economists to the conclusion that the Slattery Brookline shop has supplied from the start a long felt need in Brookline. To quote Mr. O'Connell, certainly not only the entire year of 1928, but most recently the Christmas business have shown a tremendous increase over the last year, an increase so far beyond our most sanguine expectations as to be literally overwhelming. It would seem from this that Mr. O'Connell's faith in Coolidge Corner as an auxiliary shopping district to that of downtown Boston has been fully justified. This is very gratifying. The Coolidge Corner shopping district is no longer coming, it is actually here. So uh, Coolidge Corner started as a, a shopping area to serve this growing residential neighborhood, but has become and still is a destination, not just for people from Brookline, but people from all over who come to Coolidge Corner to shop. Um, here's a picture of Coolidge Corner from the air in 1930. Um, fabulous picture that uh, um, uh, on, on our website, uh, you can zoom in on it and look at different different things. But I'm going to end with, uh, with one more picture from 1926, which was done by a, uh, a real estate company that was promoting Coolidge Corner and had uh, offices in the Coolidge Corner building. And it was Coolidge Corner of the future. This is Coolidge Corner of the Future, as was envisioned in 1926, with uh, skyscrapers. About the only thing that's recognizable is the tower of the um, SS Pierce building. I love the airship uh, called the Coolidge docked to the top of the building at the corner there. Uh, obviously, this never came to pass, although we are getting some more uh, taller buildings coming into Coolidge Corner today. But that was the vision of what Coolidge Corner uh, would be. Um, but certainly it was seen as it was and it is a thriving area that um, is just a, a, a delightful part of uh, the community that, uh, that, that we call home. Um, uh, there's much more about Coolidge Corner. Um, I have a couple of websites about Coolidge Corner on the Brookline Historical Society uh, website, uh, brooklinehistoricalsociety.org, along with many more uh, photos and images and maps. Um, and, uh, and I can always be reached at uh, kliss at brooklinehistoricalsociety.org. Um, so I'll stop the slideshow and, uh, and be very happy to take uh, any, any questions. Ken, this was just a delight for me. Um, I've only been in Brookline, I guess, about 40 years uh, all around. <laughs> and this was a real treat. Thank you. I loved it. I have a question for you. When I first came to Coolidge Corner, there was a grocery store that I think was in the Altman building on the ground floor. Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, I, I, uh, I have seen pictures of a grocery store that was there. I can't remember offhand the name. I do, I do have a project that I've been working on for years where I have been documenting uh, what businesses were in all the storefronts in Coolidge Corner from the very beginning to, uh, to the present. It can be a little, it's a little hard sometimes in, in part because um, the Brookline directories stopped that that included businesses stopped in the 1940s. So what I uh, filled in from then comes from advertisements and other things. But um, uh, if, if I don't remember, remind me and I'll I'll, I'll find the name uh, because uh, um, there there are a lot of businesses that have come and gone, and many people remember uh, many of them. I will say that the oldest uh, business in in Brookline is Simon Shoes, which was established in, uh, in, uh, in Boston 
and came to uh, to Brooklyn, I believe, in 1916. It was originally in the Pierce Block on Harvard Street, and um, uh, and there were some pictures of it there. And it moved around the corner to uh, the um, uh, the Coolidge Corner Theater Building, to one of those storefronts in the 1990s, I believe. Um, but uh, yeah, it's 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 really. I, I mean, I, I've compiled. Uh, lists of the, the businesses and advertisements, and it's really quite uh, uh, fun to uh, do that. Part of what got me started on that is I, I used to spend a lot of time looking through the microfilm in the Brookline Library uh, for, for articles, and I was just intrigued by the advertisements and uh, because it gave a, a picture of, of what it was like to be shopping in Coolidge Corner a long time ago. So, uh, you know, this this is just a tidbit of what, I, what I've got, and uh, there's, there's a lot more. So I'll try and find out what that was. All right. I also have to say I just loved the Liggett's ad. And yeah, I would love a copy of that. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, if you go to our website uh, uh, and there are some links to some things that I've done, and again, I'll 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 share them. I'll I'll, I'll send them to Susan and Joyce to send out to everybody. Uh, uh, I, I have much more on Coolidge Corner that's available online. Ken, what is the website? It's up uh, Brookline Historical Society dot dot org. Yeah, yeah, running dead. Great, thank you. Brookline Historical Society dot org. Right, and so, Laura, I see, had her hand yeah. up. Ken, what I like about what's happening now. So when we moved here forty-one years ago, Coolidge Corner was mom and pop independent stores, and then we had nothing but chains. We had Barnes and Nobles. We had the Gap. Those are all gone, and now these independents are coming back. All those independent restaurants, we have Top Drawer, we have the Boston Emporium. I love the fact that the chains are going, and we're getting back to mom and pops and in independent stores. I just think that's great. And I know it's because the rents were so high that only chains could come in. I can't imagine the rents have gone down, so I'm not sure why these independents are able to come in now, but I'm happy about it. Yeah, I, 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 a couple of comments on that. One, um, uh, pe people were complaining about chains long, long time ago. And the funny thing is, is that um, they were changed from the beginning. SS Pierce was a chain. Sure. Um, Liggett's was a chain. You know? So there were always, there were always chains to some extent. The, the other thing that I think is really uh, interesting and challenging is the growth of online shopping and what's going to happen, not just to Coolidge Corner, but to all the uh, the the kind of retail districts that have existed for a long time that 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 add a lot of life to any community, not just to Brookline. And uh, how, how will those survive in, um, in a time when, when there's so much online shopping? And, um, and I know, you know, I, I think the, the, the complaints and I, and I share them uh, in more recent years have uh, been less about chains and less about not another bank. You know, <laughs> um, uh, especially since, you know, banks, um, uh, to, to, to a certain extent are no longer places where you, you, you interact with people. You go in and you yes. use the ATM. Right. Um, so, so, so banks become just little uh, places that are machines. Um, yep. not, not entirely, obviously, but, but, um, but it's going to be interesting uh, to see what happens to this great infrastructure, this great retail infrastructure that has uh, existed for a long time. You mentioned a grocery store. Uh, might it have been a fruit market? Because there was a fruit market there. I don't recall yes. the grocery store as a grocery store within the time you moved to town, but maybe I just forgot. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll, I'll definitely find out. I, there I, was I, a fruit market. I love that yeah. little fruit market. Yep. It was great. That's true. I know yep. I've got pictures of it and uh, and and, uh, and and ads and I'll 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 figure it out. Uh, some some of my best discoveries when people ask me questions I don't know the answer to and I I love that. So well, how about this one, Ken? Um, first of all, um, I love history. My recollections of Coolidge Corner back go back to 1935 mm. when I was very young. And um, so anyway, uh, I used to live on Green Street. There was a big fire. Uh, the, every place has its disasters, and the the big fire I'm referring to was the one at the corner of Green and Harvard, where yep. uh, the proprietor I think lost his life. 
the Prider and, and, one, other, and one, one other person as well. And two people. I don't know whether you have any recollection of the place where my mother worked. She passed at 96 in 2001. She worked in Sorrell's, which oh, yeah. uh, was uh, a very well-known high-end fashion shop that had quite a history of uh, well-known people coming in. Everybody Absolutely. from the Egyptian royalty or high-end uh, Egyptian families to buy things. So uh, do you have any comments on that? Yeah, well, well certainly about the fire. Uh, I, I, uh, I know about the fire. There were two people killed. Uh, it's, it's the building on the corner, which is actually one of the older buildings in Coolidge Corner. They wouldn't know it because after the fire, it was, it was extensively redone and, and uh, uh, has a much different uh, um, uh, facade than, than it did. Um, uh, Sorrell's is not ringing a bell, but uh, that just may be uh, a it, faulty memory. The I, corner I, of Center Street, Harvard and Center Street, going north. Ah, okay. It um, was replaced by, I think, uh, Lady Grace. Lady Grace, that's what I thought. I, uh, I, I, Sorrell sure was there. Uh, Kitty Dukakis was one of their patrons, as well as the Arabs and so forth. I, I'm pretty sure there's a picture of that, and I'll, I'll find Very it. Very distinguished. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, Ken, thank you very much. In the interest of time, uh, we, uh, you know, it's a time that we adjourn and we have to respect that. But, but being very involved in the Chamber of Commerce, this is amazing. And I, I'm going to ask the Chamber that you come and speak to the board. Mm -hmm. I think they would love it. It's, it's just something unusual. Uh, you know, your information, your knowledge is exceptional. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Ken. Thank you. I'd be happy to Thank talk you, to the Ken. chamber and I, I will stick around for as long as you want to keep the thing going. So. <laughs> Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Ken. Wonderful. Thank you. That was great. Thank you Thank so you. much.